Let's do a quick review about factorization in integral domains. We were spoiled with the integers because in the integers there are several uh, coincidences. In the integer, primes and irreducibles are the same thing. Recall that in the integer we characterize a prime um, in two equivalent way. For a general domain, elements satisfying this are called primes, and elements satisfying these are called irreducibles, and they're not always the same thing. For example, let's look at z adjoint square root of minus 5. In that ring, 2 is irreducible. You can see that by checking its norm, but it's not a prime because it divides this product. However, it doesn't divide either of the term. For a general domain, the only thing we can say is that prime implies irreducible. This is mainly because integral domain has cancellation. So let's say p is a prime element. Let's see that it's irreducible. If we factor it as a, b, then p must divide a, b. So p must divide one of this. Let's say p divides a. That means we can write a as a product of p with something. And in an integral domain, we can do cancellation. So then this shows that b and s must be a unit. a, b is a unit and a is an associated p. So p is irreducible. Thus, the key they're guaranteeing that primes are irreducible is the cancellation law in the integral domain. In the special case of a UFD, though, we do have that irreducible are going to be prime. Because if we have an irreducible P dividing AB, we can just consider the unique factorization of AB into irreducibles. And this P must appear in this factorization, so it must be a factor of A or B. That's it. Unlike the integer, in which every integer has a finite factorization into irreducible and moreover the factorization is unique. For a general domain, we might not even have factorization into irreducibles and when we do have, the factorization might not be unique. For example, here in Q-bar, we can keep factoring this 2 right, into square root of 2 times square root of 2 and then smaller power and keep going on and on and on and it never stops. So we never have a factorization into irreducible. We don't even have irreducible in Q-bar. And the same thing with the ring of polynomials with rational exponents. Exactly the same thing. We call a domain a factorization domain if every element has factorization into irreducibles. For example, a Noetherian ring is going to be a factorization domain. In a Noetherian ring, this kind of infinite divisibility cannot happen because this will always create an infinite ascending chain and every ascending chain in a Noetherian ring must terminate. So in Noetherian rings, we do have factorization into irreducibles. However, the factorization will not necessarily be unique. So let's look at this example here. For example, in this ring z adjoint square root of minus 5, we have the following two different factorization of 6 into irreducibles. We can check that these are irreducible by computing the norm. Thus, we see that even when we have factorization into irreducible, the factorization is not necessarily unique. In other words, not every factorization domain is going to be a unique factorization domain. We just saw that Noetherian domains are not unique factorization domains. And it turns out that unifactorization domain are not all Noetherian either. For example, let's consider this domain here where f is a field. This is the prototype of a non-Noetherian ring. It's clearly not Noetherian because it has this ideal that's not finitely generated. But it is a UFD because it's a union of these UFD. And the element in each of these ring cannot have factorization involve variable that are beyond their ring anyway. So that means that they must have unique factorization in the big ring. Thus, that show that not all UFD are going to be Noetherian. So how do we construct Noetherian rings? How do we prove that a ring is Noetherian? Well, there are many ways. For example, starting from a Noetherian ring, we can use Hilbert basis theorem to show that polynomial rings over that ring are going to be Noetherian. Or we can take rings that are finitely generated over Noetherian rings a quotient of Noetherian rings, and so on and so on. But in all those constructions, we already assume that we started with some Noetherian rings, right? So how about we get a few Noetherian rings to start with? Well, one way is to take PID, for example. Because PID are trivially Noetherian, because every ideal is generated by just one element. So for example, Z is a PID, and a field is a PID. So then, by Hilbert basis theorem, polynomial rings over Z and polynomial rings over a field are going to be Noetherian. 
From that, we can also see that the adjoint square root of m must be Noetherian because it's a finitely generated module over the Noetherian z. Well, how do we get PID? One source of PID comes from Euclidean domain. Euclidean domains are domains where we can recover the Euclidean algorithm, where we can recover division algorithm. For that, we need a notion of remainder. In Z, when we divide A by B, we require that this remainder be less than B. But in a general domain, we don't have an ordering. So to get a notion of remainder, we pass through a Euclidean norm. And then requires that the norm of the remainder is less than the norm of B. So why are Euclidean domain principle? Well, if we take any idea in the Euclidean domain, we can just take the element with the minimal norm, and that should generate the ideal. Because if not, then there is some element A in the, in the ideal that has a remainder R when dividing by B. And this remainder R also still lies in the ideal, but it has smaller norms, so that's a contradiction. But here we see that the proof of that, the proof that Euclidean domains are PID, only use the fact that for OAB we can find some element R in the ideal generated by AB such that norm of R is less than norm of B, right? So if we if we replace the Euclidean axiom with this, then instead of a Euclidean norm, we get an almost Euclidean norm, and a domain with that kind of norm is called an almost Euclidean domain. And thus we see that almost Euclidean domains are PID. And actually, they're going to be the same thing, because if I start with a PID, I can always define some multiplicative function to the natural number so that the norm of every non-unit element is bigger than 1. Then we can show that that norm must be almost Euclidean, because this is simply because if we have any two points in a PID, we can always get its greatest common divisor, and then by multiplicativity of the norm, the norm of the greatest common divisor is always going to be less than the norm of b, unless b divides a. Thus, we see that one way to construct PID is via Euclidean domains. So when we have a ring with a Euclidean norm, then we immediately know that it's going to be a PID. Now, how do we prove that something is a Euclidean domain? Well, there's a very easy way to check whether or not a quadratic extension is a Euclidean domain. And we'll use that to sh give an example of how to classify all the imaginary quadratic Euclidean domain. The idea is to follow. So if z adjoining square root of m is Euclidean with respect to the some norm here, then for every element r plus s square root of m and t plus u square root of m in this ring, I should be able to divide this by this and get this quotient plus a remainder. Then observe that this element here can just be rewritten in this form. It's going to be of the form x plus y square root of m for sub x, y now in q instead of in z. right? And then uh, here we have a plus b square root of m, this quotient has coefficient here in z. And this remainder quotient is going to have norm less than 1. So we see that if z adjoins square root of m is Euclidean with respect to this norm, then for every element x plus y square root of m, where x, y is in q, we can find an element a plus b square root of m with coefficient in z, such that their difference, this remainder here, has norm less than 1. And this is going to be a sufficient and accessory condition. This condition is very convenient to use in the case of imaginary quadratic field, because then we can use the geometry on the complex numbers. In that case, we can view this a plus b square root of m, where a b range over z, as lattice point. Where here we're looking at the lattice on the complex plane spanned by 1 and square root of m. What this criterion means then is that for every point on the complex plane with rational coefficient, there should be a lattice point of distance at most 1 from it. But observe that the worst location for this point, x plus y, square root of m, i.e. this yellow point to b, are just the center of these rectangles. So it suffices to show that the length of this half diagonal are gonna be less than 1. And from that, we can show that the only quadratic imaginary field that are Euclidean domains under the usual norm is zi and zi adjoint square root minus 2. This, by the way, helps us give example of PID that are not Euclidean domain. We can just take any imaginary quadratic PID that are not listed in this. How do we know that this is a PID? 
Well, that's by computing class number using Minkowski's bound. That's going to be mentioned in the review about class number. Okay, but note that here we only we were only able to prove that the other imaginary quadratic fields are not Euclidean domain with respect to a specific norm. What if they are Euclidean domain with respect to other norms? Well, there is another method to prove that something is not a Euclidean domain. If a domain is Euclidean, then it must have a universal side divisor. What does that mean? Well, in a Euclidean domain that is not a field, we will have elements that are not zero or unit. So amongst those elements, let's pick one with a minimum norm. Then for every element in the Euclidean domain, when we divide them by this u, this element with minimum norm, the remainder must have norm less than norm of u. So by minimality of u, the remainder must be either zero or a unit. An element u of any domain such that for all a in the domain, we can write a as a u times b plus zero or a unit. Such an element is called a universal side divisor. So one way to show that some ring is not a Euclidean domain is by showing that it does not have a universal side divisor. This is great in the case, for example, when the unit group is very small. For example, in the case of imaginary quadratic field. Because a unit must have norm 1, and in the case of imaginary quadratic field, this is going to be a sum of positive numbers, so there are very few choices. And thus, in that case, we see that all elements minus those units must be divisible by this universal side divisor, so we can argue and see what the universal side divisor must be. An example of a universal side divisor is, for example, 2 in z, because every element is either divisible by 2, or when you subtract 1 from it, 1 is a unit, right? Subtract 1 or add 1 from it, it will become divisible by 2. Alright, so that's how we prove and disprove whether or not something is a Euclidean domain. Now finally, one last mini remark we want to make is that in a PID, every prime ideal is going to be maximal. It's going to be easy to show that because for a PID, containment really corresponds to divisibility. But this is not going to be true for a general domain. For example, in Zx, x is prime because we, when we take this quotient, we get z which is an integral domain. But x is not maximal because it's properly contained in this proper ideal 2, x. A ring in which every prime ideal is maximal is said to have dimension 1. Later you will see that even though Noetherian domains do not have unique factorization, those Noetherian domains that are of dimension 1 and integrally close do have unique factorizations, but not into prime numbers. Instead, they have unique factorization into prime ideals. And we call such Noetherian domains Dedekind domains. An example is ring of algebraic integer of an algebraic number field. So that's it. That's an extremely fast recap of factorization in a domain.